Hi, everybody. Today, I would like to read a passage from Romans, the end of chapter 9 and the beginning of chapter 10, and share a few thoughts regarding the nature of righteousness with you. Let's start to read. What shall we say then? That Gentiles, who did not pursue righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? because they did not seek it by faith, but, as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. There are two types of righteousness in the Bible. I will have a look at a few of the distinctions between the two, based on our passage in Romans. Here we see the first basic distinction. One is by the works of the law, the other by faith. It is very interesting to see that those who pursue a righteousness by the law come across a stumbling stone, and that is Christ. He will inevitably become an offense to them. We see that also today. Even those who pretend to be grace, the concept of Christ being everything in the Christian life is lost on them. Let's continue to read chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Here we read about zeal. There is good and bad zeal. After Jesus had cleansed the temple, the disciples remembered the verse from the Psalms where it says, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. Jesus' zeal was a good zeal. This passage, however, shows us a bad kind of zeal. It is a zeal for God that disregards God's righteousness. Although the Jews would, would have claimed to know God's law, they missed the central point, and that was God's righteousness. Thinking they were knowledgeable, they were actually ignorant. It is about one's own versus God's righteousness. There is yet another kind of zeal scripture tells us about. In Jesus' time, there were the zealots, they tried to fight the Romans and expel them from the land. One of Jesus' disciples, Simon, most likely was one of them. Any zeal to bring about something in one's own power that God himself has promised to do is misdirected. Jesus said to Pilate, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. There is another interesting aspect in the verses here, and that is the two verbs that are being used here. Establish is the first one. Whenever you have a merchandise mug or a sweater or whatever that has on it established in and then the year, referring to some company, you know that that is the year in which the company was founded. This implies that in that year, work started on whatever the company produces or offers. So the verb establish, in reference to one's own righteousness, has the connotation of putting in effort in order to achieve a goal. It is a verb that implies action. In contrast to that, we see the verb submit. Now, this verb is very often being used by legalists in the following context. Submit to the Lordship of Christ or in the sense of obeying commandments or orders, or people talk about serving the Lord. However, the verse says none of that. Take away all the additional concepts like lordship, obedience, service. What is left is Christ alone. It says, submit to the righteousness of God, and that is Christ.
He is our righteousness, as 1 Corinthians 1 verse, 4, verse um, 30 tells us. And he is the end of the law for those who believe. Those that still stick to it show that they haven't understood and that they don't believe, no matter how they package this. To them, to those who try to establish their own righteousness, he is a stumbling block because, as much as they might name him, their righteousness is one apart from Christ, it is their own. Although they might portray themselves as humble, obedient, and busy in service for the Lord, they refuse to submit to him himself. That would leave them without the possibility to boast in themselves. Let's continue to read. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law, the man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the word of faith which we preach. Now, here we see that the righteousness of the law is a mere hypothetical one. Theoretically, if you do what it says, and one must stress all that it says, you can live. But as it is, no one can, and that is why it is called a ministry of death in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 7. Contrasted to that is the righteousness of faith again. We see another very interesting aspect of it here. It is not a righteousness that is far, but it is one that is near. It is not an external one, but one that is near you, that is in you. Let us have a closer look at the two examples. The first is who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. That reminds me of two things. The first are the supposed visits to hell. It is a long time ago that I ever watched a video like that, but from what I remember, they have a common denominator. The people, while in hell, supposedly find out that they weren't as saved as they thought they were. They are graciously allowed to go back again with a message. This message is, you better get your act together this time, that is, sin less, be holy, keep the law better, otherwise you won't make it to heaven. All those, quote, lukewarm Christians, that is, those that sin a lot and don't serve the Lord enough, are deceived and now must clean themselves up. The Christ those people bring up from hell and see it as their mission to proclaim is a false Christ. Secondly, there are people like Joyce Meyer from the Word of Faith movement who say that Jesus went to hell to die spiritually, that he was tortured in hell and was no longer the Son of God while there, and that he was the first born again man. This is, of course, absolute heresy. The Word of Faith teaching degrades Jesus and deifies men. So, the Christ that is brought up from the dead is a false one. The second point is, it says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above. Again, two examples of that come to mind. First, there are those whose only focus is the rapture and who try to calculate the, the time span or a date and who think that watching for Jesus' return means to observe all possibilities that might give a clue as to when he could come back. They are basically trying to bring him down from heaven. The concept behind this is Christ is up there in heaven and we are down here and our focus should be to try to figure out as precisely as possible how close the rapture could be. Now, of course, every Christian should look forward to the rapture, and yes, 
we do expect him, as it says in Philippians 3, verse 20, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. However, this is not the only truth we find in Scripture. Not only do we await him from heaven, but he also lives in us. In Colossians 1, Paul talks about the mystery, and that is Christ in us, the hope of glory. On the one hand, according to Titus 2, verse 13, we look for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. But on the other hand, in 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 10, it says, When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe. So both are true. He, the morning star, will rise in our hearts and will descend from heaven and we will meet him in the clouds. And then there is another group that comes to mind, the New Apostolic Reformation, those who teach, quote, kingdom now. They also want to bring Jesus down from heaven, but they think it is in their might to make him come down. They themselves want to create kingdom conditions so that he can come back. They are convinced that that which only Jesus himself can bring about can be brought about by them. They believe that once they have established the kingdom here on earth, Jesus will come back and receive it from them. As with the visits to hell, man is deified. They say that in the process of bringing in the kingdom, they will become immortal and that they are, quote, little gods. And Christ in his divine nature is being lowered to man's level. Talking about zeal, I said, any zeal to bring about something in one's own power that God himself has promised to do is misdirected. This is what we have here. God is the one who will bring in the kingdom at his own conditions and in his timing. In this heretical concept, man is usurping God's role, believing the serpent's lie that he can be like God. So, both in bringing up and bringing down Christ, we are dealing with a false Jesus and a false image of man. Then it says in verse 8, The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach. This is a quote from Deuteronomy 30, verses 11 through 14. For this commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, the Hebrew word for mysterious here means hidden, nor is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. Now, note this is Old Testament. We would think that back then God was an external God and indeed far off, but no, even then he was near. Jesus is the Word, and through the Word and by faith they were brought near. Of course, this cannot be compared to what we have today. Jesus is indeed near and not far. We do not have an external Jesus we follow. We are not, as many say, disciples following after him. We aren't slaves either, following their master's orders. Let's read what Paul preached in Athens. We find that in Acts 17. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For, as I was passing through, and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you, God, who made the world and everything in it. 
since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Nor is he worshipped with man's hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord, in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Before he even started to talk about Jesus, he presented a God that is near. How much more is this true for us today? We have a very different, far deeper reality. He lives in us. He is one with us. So, in summary, let us have a look again at the two opposing concepts of righteousness presented to us here in Romans. It is faith on the one hand and works of the law on the other. It is God's righteousness as opposed to one's own. The own righteousness must be established. God's righteousness, in contrast, is something we must learn to submit to, which simply means to accept it as completely sufficient and to quit establishing one's own. And, maybe a concept that is not so often thought about in this context, we have a righteousness that is near, not one that is far. This is good news. All you got to do is believe it.